Oh, I love that question. That's what design attends to. So I would say if a dentist is providing excellence in the clinical and patient care, they feel confident that that's what they're providing out there, I think the next step is to look at the facility. Is the facility congruent with that care? In other words, is it making a statement that reinforces the fact that they've come to a place of excellence or is it detracting? Um, looking at some examples of that, I think a great one is clutter. It's a very easy thing to fix, but it's often overlooked in a facility. Walk from the front door to the back door of your facility and see and look through the patient's eyes at perhaps the clutter that's there. Get things off the countertop, put things in storage, have your office look neat and tidy, and those are signals that a patient will pick up on and they perceive as a reflection of the quality of the care they're going to receive. And I think that's the key right there. Patients, unfortunately or fortunately, take their cues from what they see and how it's beyond the clinical performance you may be providing. They actually are taking cues from what they see and uh, what that feels like to them when they're in the facility. I think another good example is just repair and maintenance. If you've got things in disrepair uh, or you're not maintaining the finishes very, very nicely, then that also is a cue to the patients that the excellence that you say you're providing, in fact, is not evidenced by the facility. So I guess in summary, the facility would be the next step. Uh, you can certainly take it beyond clutter and maintenance and move into things such as upgrading and updating the facility. And that's often where clients come to us. We assist them with upgrades. Uh, when they realize and, and come to us and say, you know what, my dentistry is 1975 in my experience, but I don't want my dentistry to look like 1975 based on my facility. My facility, I realize, is my brand. I want it to market my dentistry. There's the new shiny doctor's office down the street, and I hear from patients, boy, that guy must really know what he's doing because it's clean, it's tidy, it's nice and shiny. And I look at my facility and I realize it doesn't reflect the quality of care that I really am as a seasoned practitioner providing. So next step, look at your facility. What is it doing to reinforce or not reinforce? And that will definitely improve your patient's comfort and confidence in the excellence that you say you're providing. Ooh, I love that question as well. Lighting is one of my favorite design tools. And quite frankly, it's underutilized and it's not well understood, even in the design industry. Um, I love the fact that you're asking about varied lighting because what you're keying in on is we as human beings, as patients, we enjoy variations in light. And unfortunately, most dental offices are lit with two by four fluorescent ceilings, with two by four fluorescent fixtures from the front door to the back door. There's no change in light, there's no variation in light, and it's an indication that you've kind of gone unconscious about what the experience of each space is. Lighting is a key design tool. I talk about the design toolkit, and lighting is one of the number one things you pull out to say how can it, in fact, increase and improve the facility as far as patient comfort. I definitely would say that very lighting Think in terms of, I think a great example is if you think in terms of sitting under a tree and looking up through the leaves at the dappled light. Anytime you describe something like that to somebody, they would say, yes, that's restful. I would enjoy something like that. You're imagining the breeze. You're seeing the variation in light. Light is a major component of that. What we're trying to do in a dental facility in the artificial environment is to mimic nature. And nature tells us that lights and darks of light are something that are very comforting, very comfortable, and introducing that into the facility, your facility, is definitely going to improve patient's comfort. All right, well, specific recommendations, the way we would talk about it in a dental facility is you develop a lighting strategy. Sounds really weird, but a lighting strategy is about you're going to be deliberate about what's going to happen in the lighting in a facility. Very simply, a great way to approach it is you're going to separate your tasks from your experiential areas. And by that, I mean there are going to be areas of task using the lab as an example. It is an area of task. There's not an experience trying to happen. Patients are not utilizing that space. 
So we definitely want to have high light conditions. A good solution to that is the 2 by 4 fluorescent light fixture sitting in an acoustical ceiling or even a hard ceiling. We want to wash light throughout that space. We want to have good light. And even under cabinet lighting is another part of that solution in a lab area where we definitely want to have good light along a countertop where we're doing very specific procedures that require high light. Contrasting to that, are areas of experience, where the patient is going to be, where there are no tasks being attended to, waiting spaces, consultation spaces, orders, where the patient walks from the waiting area back to the operatory. Those are wonderful applications for indirect lighting, for specialty or decorative lighting, for recessed cans that are on dimmers where you can actually lower the light level and have it contrast highlight areas. One thing that I would say about the operatory is I look at the operatory not only as task, I also look at it as experiential. Task, most certainly the primary task in a dental office is the procedures that are happening at that chair with the dentist. So definitely we need to have high light conditions. And we have conversations with dentists about are you using a headlamp? Are you definitely using the dental um, exam chair light? Uh, and then beyond that, what light level is going to be comfortable to you? older dentists are going to want a real highlight condition. I'm an older person. I'm sensitive to that as well. I need a highlight condition to feel comfortable and confident that I'm providing good care. By the same token, that patient is laying back in the chair, looking up and having an experience. So what is it that I'm looking at as a patient that improves my experience, that increases my comfort, increases my confidence in what we're doing here? And so things like introducing certainly things to the ceiling like beams, interesting coffers, materials that might improve my experience, but definitely where are those lights positioned so I'm not looking into the lamps, that I'm not getting glare into my eyes. Those are all strategies, if you will, where we marry task and experience in the operatory as an example. So love the question. A lighting strategy is something that is just like everything else in designing the floor plan is what are we going to do on the ceiling to improve and reinforce the comfort the function, the experience of that patient in this facility. You know, sound control is probably one of the one things that you don't have to coach a dentist on very often. They typically will come to us and say, um, by the way, I'm concerned about sound. Talk about a pediatric dentist. They are very sensitive to the crying child and the mother out in the waiting area that may be hearing that. How do they contend or mitigate that sound? Oral surgery, we have sedated patients and a sedated patient may cry out um, unbeknownst to them but certainly they may um, utter noises that don't want to be heard out in the waiting area space. And then for the GP, even just the discomfort that most patients have when they hear that high-speed handpiece those are all sounds associated with the dentistry and unfortunately they are disconcerting to the patient or at least most patients so sound is definitely going to be an issue in the dental facility and if we don't mitigate it if we don't attend to it then it's definitely going to affect the patient's comfort and there's some specific things that you can do ooh there's some great things that you can do and I'll, I'll outline them as such and um, not all of them are utilized or uh, inserted in the dental office, so I'm glad that you're asking this question because I think they're very, very important and often overlooked. The first thing, certainly, assuming that you're doing a new office, is any place where you have sensitivity related to patient privacy is you want to introduce sound walls. And a sound wall is very specifically a wall that goes from the floor, certainly, all the way up through to the decking. Now, a lot of dental offices, especially in lease spaces, those walls will go from the floor and stop at the ceiling. I put an acoustical tile ceiling in there, and I assume that I've got a sound mitigated room. And you really don't, because sound will travel even beyond one acoustical tile ceiling to the next operatory. So when we are, what we're suggesting here is that you introduce sound walls, sound walls that go two layers of sheetrock, all the way up to the deck or wherever that will stop on the underside of structure and then you insulate that wall. That wall has bad insulation in it and in some cases for instance in a quiet op, a surgical op, some dentists that are highly concerned about sound will even put bad insulation on top of an acoustical tile ceiling. So that would be the first step and 
I would say the second step, again, if you have the opportunity and you're remodeling or doing a new office, would be to change the ceiling heights. Something that's not well understood is you have an acoustical tile ceiling, all at eight foot, all at nine foot, whatever it is, and it runs at the same level throughout the space. What you have in that ceiling is a conduit, a conduit for sound. There's an assumption that just because it's acoustical tile that it's helping with sound. Yes, it is. But the reality is whatever sound will hit, it will travel. And so a flat ceiling throughout a dental office, those offices very typically are loud and noisy. And the question about that is why is that when I'm using acoustical tile? Well, here's the key. You want to change the ceiling heights. The way you do that is you can introduce beams. We call, talk about headers where you drop headers down or walls down. Uh, you divide the space, soffits that you see over front desks, areas where there's layers of ceiling. While it is an aesthetic impression, in other words, you're changing the form of the space, you're making it more interesting, it's actually solving a functional issue, and that is trapping sound. So I think that's a great step to take as far as handling sound. So let's talk a little bit about the dentist who does not have the option to change the ceiling or to introduce sound walls. Um, one thing we would say is in any space where you are trying to deal with the pri patient's privacy, is add absorptive materials. Uh, think in terms of your box. When I say box, I'm talking about I've got ceiling, I've got walls, I've got a floor. So on the ceiling, what can I do? You can certainly add acoustical tile. You can add second layers of acoustical tile. You can add sheetrock coffers. There are things that you can do to the ceiling, and we have done that, where you actually trap the sound within that space more effectively. Uh, on the walls, wall coverings. Many dental offices are painted. Nothing wrong with paint except it does nothing to help with sound. So introducing wall coverings, believe it or not, in a type 2 wall covering, which is a heavier duty wall covering, that will actually help mitigate sound. So for instance, in a consultation space, perhaps you're painting the rest of the office, but in the spaces of privacy, we're going to introduce wall coverings for a functional reason to deal with the sound. On the floor, certainly carpet. Carpet is going to be the best solution for absorbing sound. It lowers the fear just because it looks less medicinal. So it solves a functional issue as well, but it will definitely absorb sound. And I, for those of you that are afraid of carpet, I would just simply say the carpet industry has come a long way from even five years ago. So the performance of your carpet will definitely be a good solution. Uh, you don't have to worry about its wear or tear, and it definitely will deal with the sound. So again, I appreciate that question. Sound is a huge issue for most dentists, and there are techniques and ways that you can approach it that are very effective that I would say that you take very seriously when you're considering how can I improve the patient's comfort? How can I create privacy for that patient? That's the, that's the objective. We want our patients to feel safe, to talk about any concerns they've got about their diagnostic treatment or any questions that they've got. So that's the objective. Ooh, that's a good question as well. Furniture. Sometimes it's an afterthought. There's not a lot of thought put into it. And in fact, uh, furniture is an important accessory. It reinforces whatever is happening in the space. It's a further reflection of the level of quality. And probably more so than whatever paint color you use, the quality of that furniture is going to be a reflection of the quality of care. Again, we're talking about the patient taking cues from what I see, what I feel, what I experience in a space. Think about any uh, office, any business that you've been to. When you walked in there, if the furniture was dated, if it was in disrepair, I actually went in an office recently where there was duct tape on the vinyl cushion, and it was shocking to me that somebody would be so asleep about the furniture and the experience we were having in the waiting area that they would have a chair with duct tape on it. Maybe it was going to be there just for that day. I don't know. But what it's telling me is that I need to be concerned about how awake they are, to the service that they're going to render to me. Well, your patients are doing the same thing. So while I'm not saying or suggesting that you have to spend thousands and thousands of unreasonable dollars in furniture, you should be conscious of it. Some of the pointers I might offer to you, for instance, in a waiting space. In a waiting space, I would say vary the furniture. We're very used to, in a residential setting, having a love seat and a couple of chairs. Change the seating. The um, approach where you have 18 chairs that are all alike and all the same color are going to remind us of a clinic. They're going to remind us of experiences that are scary. So if you want to lower the patient's fear, you want to improve the patient comfort, 
you want to start emulating, if you will, even though this is a contract commercial environment, you want to emulate those things that make us comfortable. And those things that make us comfortable are living room settings. So introduce that. Other things to think about with furniture are the various sizes that your patients are going to come in. There should always be uh, seating available for someone who may have difficulty getting in, out of, in and out of seating, for someone who might be very large and needs to negotiate um, or will have difficulty negotiating smaller scaled seating. So those are things that you can do for your patients, again, thinking in terms of their comfort and uh, improving their confidence in you. Another thing I would just add is we love wood. Wood is something that we can relate to as opposed to metal. Now, maybe metal is part of your style, and maybe that's part of the personality you're, you're wanting to project. But what I would say typically is people like wood. I like a wood arm. I like wood furniture. That is a statement of quality. So those are the things that you can do. But very quickly, I would just say to any dentist, go back into your waiting area, that space that you rarely go into because you're coming in the back door most of the time. Look at that waiting space. What does it say to you? that reinforces that excellence that we started talking about earlier on. Is it actually reinforcing it or is it a detraction? And if it's a detraction, there are steps that you can take most certainly, and I would suggest that you do as a way of improving your patient's comfort.